It's the ultimate prize lurking at the fringes of our solar system, an enduring mystery that has felt so tantalizingly close to a solution for decades, yet remains just inches from our grasp. His name is Planet X, alternatively known as Planet Nine, and for as long as the scientific world has understood that there were eight planets in our solar system, we've suspected there just might be another. Is a scientific frustration, a mathematical riddle, fantastic branding opportunity for everyone and everything trying to be even the slightest bit alternative, and it is still nowhere to be found. But astronomers are getting more advanced in their work every day. New telescopes and instruments are rising up into orbit, and just simply by reason alone, you might imagine that humanity is closer to discovering Planet Nine than ever. According to some of the experts out there, you'd be absolutely right. And this long theorized object is now being hunted down like Bigfoot being chased into a cave that quickly turns into a dead end. According to the naysayers, we're just as far away as we've ever been, chasing mathematical ghosts and looking for answers to the wrong questions. So today on Astrographics, we're going to ask two questions. Where and why? Where is the search for Planet Nine headed today? And why, as the idea's detractors insist that there's no reason to be optimistic, do some of its proponents insist that we're closer than ever? It's not a hard and fast rule of astronomy, but it's certainly a trend. The cooler a name that something has, the more likely it is to end up misunderstood by much of the public. We humans were curious creatures with active imaginations, and with Planet Nine more so than most topics in our universe, those imaginations tend to run a bit wild. So, to understand where the search for Planet Nine is today, uh, we've got to start by winding back the clock and figuring out precisely how we got here. The origin of human understanding around Planet Nine was the discovery of Planet Eight. Neptune, sitting way past the range where it could be easily spotted with the naked eye like Mars or Jupiter, was only identified in 1846, and it wasn't seen with a telescope, at least not exactly. The discovery of Neptune was not nearly so much a product of stargazing as it was a product of mathematics, with a French astronomer named Urban Le Verrier calculating out the position in the sky where it was expected to be based on a number of observations of irregularities in the orbit of the planet Uranus. When astronomer Johann Gottfried Gahl spotted Neptune, it was by pointing his telescope at the spot Le Verrier had said Neptune would be, finally confirming the existence of a celestial body astronomers had expected to be there for some time. In a clear indicator of just how critical mathematical projections were in finding Neptune, science historians have since pieced together that several astronomers, including both Galileo and the son of the guy, who had discovered Uranus had already noted observations of a celestial body that we now know was Neptune. Yet none had recognized it as a planet until predictive mathematical calculations lent a helping hand. The reason why the discovery of Neptune is so important to understand is because the vast majority of efforts to discover a planet beyond Neptune have been conducted in broadly the same way. Rather than scouring the night sky with telescopes, knowing that they were trying to find a needle in a solar system-sized haystack, the vast majority of serious attempts to identify Planet Nine have done it via mathematical means. That's an effort that's been going on for well over a century, and it really kicked off when a mathematician named Percival Lowell attempted to predict the orbit and location of a large trans-Neptunian planet. Since then, a range of astronomers and number crunchers have attempted to pin down these same bits of information, relying on signs and signals sent from the far edges of the solar system. Like any good series of equations, the math required to pinpoint Planet Nine needs numerical values, assumptions that can be plugged in, tweaked as necessary and used as part of a calculation when new data or newly specific assumptions become available. Most important among those assumptions are what we believe about the planet's mass. Exact mass estimates vary somewhat based on who, precisely, you're asking and their methodology, but a particularly well-founded 2022 analysis by researchers Michael Brown and Konstantin Batagin suggests that the planet's mass is equivalent to about 6.3 Earth masses, give or take an Earth mass or two. By contrast, Uranus, the least massive of the gas giants, despite having having a radius greater than Neptune is about 14 times the mass of Earth. The hypothetical planet Nine's distance from the Sun is also at least somewhat narrowed down, albeit with a fairly wide range of possibilities. Planet Nine is believed to be 560 times further from the Sun than Earth is, or 560 astronomical units away, plus 260 astronomical units, or minus 140 in the margin of error. At its closest, it's 350 astronomical units away from the Sun, plus 80 or minus 70. It's believed to have a relatively eccentric orbit, flying out 
far from the sun before swinging back in to make a closer pass, and that the orbit is believed to be inclined about 16 degrees plus or minus 5 off kilter with the orbital plane of our solar system. What all this means is that the gravitational influence of Planet 9 is not anything that we've observed in the solar system so far. It's not Pluto, it's not Sedna, it's not Eris, it's not any of the other dwarf planets way out in that region. It also orbits much too close to Earth for it to be any sort of brown dwarf star that would fit with earthly expectations of brown dwarves, meaning that it is almost certainly not the burned out husk of a star that would have once formed a binary system with our Sun. It's very, very unlikely to be a primordial black hole dating back to the first few seconds after the Big Bang. To have the gravitational effects we see from the supposed Planet Nine, such a black hole would only need to be about the size of a grapefruit, but it's regarded as a very slim possibility, even if it would be pretty cool if it happened that way. More likely than any of those options by a very wide margin is the possibility that Planet Nine is a so-called Super Earth, a rocky planet that just happens to be about six times the size of our own. Astronomers are very confident that such a thing is possible. For example, three Super Earths of that size or larger have been identified within the habitable zones of their stars just within the nearest 40 light years of the Sun. Planet Nine may not have an exterior made of rock, it could be an icy body like Europa or Enceladus, but the general idea is that it's a hard surface planet rather than a gaseous one. And the signs of Planet Nine go far beyond the strange little tugs on Neptune's orbit. Its presence manifests itself through the existence of objects out in the Kuiper Belt on the fringes of the solar system that orbit on a strange elliptical plane that they shouldn't. Some on a 20 to 30 degree tilt with the solar system and some at a 90 degree angle, basically going up and down where the planets go round and round. That sort of orbital tilt is best explained by the presence of a celestial body making such a thing happen. Other studies have suggested that the planet's influence on the gravitational structure of the solar system might have caused the slight tilt of the eight major planets relative to the sun's equator. Gravitational disturbances out in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud are attributed to it, like comets whose orbit around the sun suggests they might have once been scattered outward by a passing gravitational mass. All signs point to the existence of something out there, and through mathematics alone, researchers have been able to describe elements of it with reasonable confidence. But it wasn't until this year, 2024, that some of the clearest evidence for Planet Nine's existence ever has finally come along. The new evidence that we're referencing today comes from one of those same researchers we mentioned earlier, Konstantin Batagin of Caltech, who, along with colleague Mike Brown, wrote out a roadmap to find Planet Nine nearly a decade ago and has contributed substantial research ever since. But even for a researcher well accustomed to making popular science headlines, the paper Batagin published in 2024 was something special. The paper's findings were rooted in a simulation model of the Milky Way, in which the known celestial forces of the Sun, of all the planets, of all all the known major bodies in the solar system, all the nearby stars and known planets, and the entire Milky Way were all plugged in together. Sometimes, when Batagin and his team ran the simulations, they included a planet 9 under a series of slightly tweaked parameters. Other times, they didn't. Overwhelmingly, the simulations that featured a Planet Nine in any configuration matched the conditions observed in our solar system far better than without a Planet Nine, and specific simulations matched our solar system very, very well. Per Batagen himself, the new evidence doesn't just point the finger squarely at Planet Nine for these gravitational oddities. The paper also indicates that there is only a 0.0000573% chance, or smaller, that the situation could be explained in a solar system without a ninth planet. And when we dig a little bit deeper into what the Caltech team found, the results are even more intriguing because of how they address a long-standing criticism of the mechanisms they've used to draw conclusions thus far. The practice of tracking odd elliptical orbits in our solar system involving not just planets but those far smaller objects we mentioned previously has long been a central component of the hunt for Planet Nine. But as a catch. The vast majority of highly elliptical orbiting objects tended to cluster together with similar tilts on a similar plane away from the plane the planets and the Sun are on, and with similar furthest and closest points in their orbit around the Sun. For those looking to identify a ninth planet, that's been some cause for frustration, because skeptics on the idea have argued that the gravity source that supposedly pulls all these objects into strange orbits is simply an accident of statistics. By their logic, the only reason why human observers are seeing such a 
clustering of trans-Neptunian objects in this way is that they happen to be using telescopes to analyze the portion of the sky where those objects happen to be. Because most trans-Neptunian objects are very dim or nearly invisible if you're not looking directly at them, a lack of study of other parts of the night sky meant that researchers could have completely missed the truth of their distribution. That is to say, in reality, those objects might be distributed uniformly in all orbital planes, but we simply never notice because we don't go looking. But the Caltech team offered a rebuttal, and again, their results support the existence of some gravitational source way out there in the far solar system. This time, the group studied specifically objects that didn't cluster together with others in orbit, but still orbited very, very far from the Sun for most of their orbital period before sweeping in and passing closer to the Sun than Neptune does and slingshotting back out again. What the team found was that these trans-Neptunian objects were fundamentally unsustainable for these small celestial bodies. Orbit for long enough, a few million years or so, and their orbit will eventually line up with the orbit of Neptune in a way that makes Neptune's gravity act on them in an atypical way. Basically, they happen to make too close of a pass and their orbit is permanently altered, perhaps scattered into another orbit or perhaps even jettisoned out of the solar system. And from that finding, there's one critical takeaway. The trans-Neptunian objects we see now with their long elliptical orbits haven't always been part of that orbit. After all, if they were formed and began orbiting that way when the solar system formed, Neptune would have thrown them all out long ago. Something had to cause them to assume that orbit for the few million years they'll orbit in that way. And that's where things get really rather interesting. Trace the orbits of these trans-Neptunian objects, and there's no single point in time where they all would have been pushed into this elliptical orbit at once. A passing star, a passing black hole, or any other short-term visitor certainly has the potential to throw these objects into weird new orbits. But the objects that we can see now weren't all thrown into their orbits at the same time. With Neptune throwing these objects out of the solar system from time to time, that means that their stock must be replenished continuously. And according to the research team, there are only two things that could make that happen. The first is a galactic tide, the grand tidal force of the Milky Way acting on objects way out on the fringes of the solar system where the sun's gravity is hardly enough to keep them in orbit at all. With such a weak solar force, these objects might be susceptible to occasional nudges in one direction or the other by the Milky Way's grand tides, but some such a tidal motion would most likely send a whole bunch of trans-Neptunian objects tumbling toward the Earth at around the same time, and that doesn't seem to have happened. The other option, however, is a gravitational source that lives in our solar system's outer fringes for the long term. Orbiting on its own far elliptical orbit, traveling way out into space for most of its solar year, a gravitational source like that, Planet Nine, would be capable of interacting with and tossing a few objects into trans-Neptunian orbits of their own whenever it came back for a close pass with Earth. But what it wouldn't do is act on large numbers of objects at once like a galactic tide or a passing star would. Instead, with its subtler gravitational influence, it might toss just a few objects into trans-Neptunian orbit at a time, replenishing them as Neptune continues in its orbit and tosses them out. When the research team ran simulations with both options, the galactic tide and the Planet Nine gravitational influence, the results were crystal clear. The galactic tides were not nearly strong enough to push beyond Neptune objects into a trans-Neptunian orbit, and if they were, then the orbits of those objects would look totally unlike the real orbital paths that astronomers can observe. It simply didn't work. But insert Planet Nine, and it works beautifully. So clearly, the search for Planet Nine comes with a whole lot of reasons to be confident. But ask anybody with even a tangential association to the efforts to find it, and they're likely to agree. Uh, not everybody's so optimistic. Like every scientific hypothesis, the hypothesis that Planet Nine explains the strange orbit of some trans-Neptunian objects must be tested, and more precisely, those who wish to support it must first do so by working hard to disprove it. And when it comes to the possibility that Planet Nine doesn't exist, the arguments can, at times, be just as compelling. One source of skepticism comes from simple probability that all of the regions of the night sky where Planet Nine could possibly be, nearly 80% of it, has already been analyzed, and there's nothing there. That leaves a 1 in 5 chance that Planet Nine is sitting out there waiting for us to point a telescope at it, but a 4 in 5 chance that it's not responsible for the gravitational effects we see in the far reaches of the solar system. Now, a 1 in 5 chance of something is broadly considered fairly good odds. When researchers try to answer questions, like these, but it still means that astronomers are running out of room to search. Nor is it likely that our technology would simply be insufficient to spot a planet all the way out there. After all, we're pretty good at finding exoplanets in other solar systems. But 
If nothing emerges from that last 20-ish percent, another gravitational anomaly might be to blame. Researchers have suggested that if optical telescopes fail to find Planet 9, then it'll be worth trying with radio telescopes. But whether the powers that be here on Earth would initiate round two of a great big search, that's another matter. Other criticisms of the Planet 9 theory are a good bit further reaching. Take, for example, the position of Dr. Catherine Brown, a theoretical physicist out of NASA's Hamilton College, who suggested in 2024 that the gravitational effects we witness may not be attributable to a ninth planet, but instead to a fundamental misunderstanding of how gravity works. Brown and her colleagues have focused on the use of modified Newtonian dynamics, referred to as MOND, to tweak the current gravitational model in ways that have been successful, at least so far, in predicting other known observations in the universe. And we're not going to dive too terribly deeply into to Mont here, but the really important piece of Mont for our purposes is what it predicts for the outer solar system where the sun's gravity is weak. All the way out there, Mont predicts a gravitational effect that aligns very, very well with the elliptical orbits astronomers have observed without there having to be a gravitational source out there. The researchers behind the idea, Brown included, initially tested Mond's effects in that area while attempting to disprove it, assuming that the Planet 9 theory and the accompanying data would align far closer with reality than the models that Mond would predict. Instead, Mond turned out to hit the bullseye. As Brown herself explained it, this means that scientists are in the position to discover one or two pretty cool new things. Quoting here, we are at the exciting juncture where either a new planet might be discovered in the outer solar system or a new law of gravity, but both cannot exist at once. And if Mond proves to be so well supported that it's incontrovertible, then Planet 9 may become its necessary casualty in the process. Yet, for both Planet 9 believers and its skeptics, there is one piece of evidence that would simply be incontrovertible. That, of course, is a direct sighting, a clear observation of a planet where a planet should be. And as mathematical evidence mounts to offer greater and greater precision, the astronomy world gets closer to opening day for a new telescope with the potential to settle the debate once and for all. It's called the Vera Rubin Observatory. It'll open in Chile in 2025, and using its 8.4-meter telescope, it'll conduct nightly surveys of the night sky for the foreseeable future. The Vera Rubin Telescope is a very powerful one, capable of observing trans-Neptunian objects, tracking their orbits, and inclinations and identifying so-called centaurs, objects that orbit in reverse compared to most orbiting bodies. The Vera Rubin Observatory's sheer capacity for data collection will play itself out in one of two ways, either demonstrating that the evidence that Planet 9's proponents have relied on for so long is actually just statistical biases, or confirming that they really do present an anomaly that only a ninth planet can explain. And if it's the latter, then with the observatory's capabilities and its potential to narrow down the position of a ninth planet in orbit, it just might might be able to claim the ultimate prize, a direct observation of this planet, forever confirming what a substantial portion of astronomers believe is almost certainly true. If that happens, it'll be a modernized iteration of the discovery of Neptune, repeated well over a century and a half later. Through the use of observation and extrapolating mathematics, astronomers have been chasing a ghost in the far reaches of the solar system, but find it, and the world will have the rare opportunity to see a ghost come to life. After that, it'll be elementary, giving it a name, getting better and better images of it as time goes on, and maybe, one day, sending a probe to say hello. Make no mistake, Planet 9 still absolutely could be an illusion, but the signs of its presence lurking just outside our awareness are clearer today than they have ever been.